Let's let x, comma d be a complete metric space. So x is a set and d is a metric. Remember that's a function that acts like a ruler, allows you to measure distance between two points. And by complete, we mean any Cauchy sequence of points in x has a limit l that is also an element of x. Now here's our definition we're gonna play with first. A subset A of X is said to be dense in X if the closure of A is equal to the whole set X. In other words, the smallest closed set containing A is just the whole set X. Now that means that for any element X in the space and any positive real number R, there exists an element little a from capital A such that little a belongs to the ball centered at X of radius R. Let's look at an example to try to demonstrate this definition. So if x is the real line, and we measure distance between two real numbers in the usual way, just the absolute value of the difference of two real numbers, then the rational numbers q, those form a dense subset of the real numbers. And to show you a picture of what I'm saying, if you put any real number and plot it on the real line, call it x, we could take any interval around x that I like, say r units to the left and r units to the right, and we're going to call that a ball. That's my notation B uh, with the center is X. And then after the semicolon, the radius is R. But in, in this context, that's just the interval X minus R to X plus R with parentheses. Anyway, to say that the rational numbers are dense is trying to say that no matter what interval you put around little X here, you can always find a rational number inside that interval. The next definition we're going to look at is we're going to say a subset A of our uh, metric space X is nowhere dense, again, in X. If for each element of the closure of A, there is no positive real number R, such that the ball centered at A of radius R is completely contained inside the closure of A. Now that means that the interior of the closure of A is empty. There's nothing in the interior of the closure of A. Another way to say that is that the closure of A does not contain any non-trivial open subsets of X. In particular, in a metric space, it contains no open balls. So here's an example of a familiar nowhere dense set. So again, take the real line, measure distance between two real numbers in the typical way, absolute value of their difference. And then the integers form a nowhere dense set of the real numbers. And to try to see this, if you took any real number that is not an integer, uh, then yeah, I'm gonna plot it right here, here's x. And we can choose the integer a, and I'll plot those here too. I've plotted, you know, the integer to the left of A and the integer to the right of A. Anyway, how am I choosing A? Well, I'm choosing A such that the distance from X to A is minimum. In other words, you could always find the integer that's closest to X. We'll call that A. And we're going to call that distance R. That's how far A is from X. And what we'll do is we're just going to construct the interval of radius R over 2. And so the point is that that interval can't have any integers in it. That yellow interval has no integers inside of it. And so that demonstrates here that the integers are nowhere dense. Now, an important connection we want to make between dense and nowhere dense. They sound like complete opposites of each other, and they, they're pretty close, but it's, there's a little bit of tricky stuff we got to get through. So to say that A is nowhere dense in X, that's equivalent to saying that the interior of the closure of A is empty. We wrote that above earlier. Now, that's equivalent to saying that for each element X, there is no radius R such that the ball centered at X of radius R is contained in the closure of A. So in other words, the closure of A contains no non-trivial open sets of X. And that's equivalent to saying that for each element x in the space x and for each radius r, that the ball centered at x of radius r uh, intersected with the complement of the closure of A that has to be non-empty. In other words, each non-trivial open set of x has some point from the complement of the closure of A. But that just says that the complement of the closure of A is a dense open subset of X. And I get to use that adjective open here because the closure of A, well, it's closed. And I know that the complement of a closed set is open. So a recap of what all these if and only ifs are trying to say, all these equivalences, is it's saying that to say A is nowhere dense in X, that's equivalent to saying that the complement of the closure of A is a dense open set of X. So those are the two things that we want to think about as being equivalent to each other. And let me give you an example, and this will kind of uh, recap my example above with the real line and the integers. So if I think about what we said earlier, we saw that the integers were a nowhere dense subset of the real line because no ball can consist only of red points. 
And that's equivalent to thinking about the following. If I look at the real numbers that are not integers, I have a bar above the Z there, but I know that the integers are closed uh, on the real line so that I don't really need the bar. It's its own closure. And what I'm saying here is that this is dense on the real line. The set of non-integers is a dense subset of the real line. In other words, all balls must have a blue point. And to just try to show you that, I've colored in blue all the non-integers. What I'm saying is if you pick any real number x, then if I put any ball around x, of course it's going to have a blue point in it. So that's what we're trying to demonstrate. So these two pictures are trying to communicate um, an equivalent idea. So what are some typical questions in math that we want to try to answer? And so one such question is, if you've got a bunch of sets, and let's say a bunch of sets, what's that mean? Like finitely many, or maybe a countably infinite family of sets? And if they all have property P, you know, some property, uh, does the union or the intersection of all of these sets also have property P? So concretely, is the intersection of a bunch of dense open subsets still dense? Another question uh, that we would like to answer in math is, you know, sometimes the property that I know about the real numbers, is that really a corollary uh, to some much more general theorem about, say, complete metric spaces? And in particular, you know, is there a topological argument for why the real numbers are uncountable? And uh, the answer to this is going to be, well, answered by what's called the Bayer Category Theorem for Complete Metric Spaces. And its statement of the Bayer Category Theorem is, if you have a collection, UN, and that's a countable collection indexed by the natural numbers, that's a collection of dense open subsets of a complete metric space X with metric D, then the intersection of all of these dense open subsets is still dense in the metric space. And so that kind of is along the same lines as the first question I ask. Each of the U's has this property of being dense, and when I take their intersection, is it still dense? And the answer here, at least in this context of a complete metric space, the answer is yes. So we're going to get into the proof of the Bayer Category Theorem, and it's probably going to take a while in this video, so buckle up. But uh, hopefully, um, if you've read it in a textbook and maybe found it confusing, hopefully you find this helpful. And we're going to give a nice constructive proof that even critics of the axiom of choice would approve of. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, if you've got time, go check out my video on the axiom of choice that's also in this topology playlist. So let's let x be an element of our metric space, and let's let r be a positive real number. And remember, what we've got to show here, to show that the intersection of all these u's is a dense subset of capital X, we need to show that, well, the ball centered at x of radius r intersected with all of the u's has to be non-empty. They have to have some element in common. And the main idea for how we're going to do this is the following. We're going to see how the hypothesis that our metric space is complete, that's crucial for discovering an element y that's in both the ball centered at x of radius r and in all of the un's. And what we'll also do is we'll use the density of each un to build a Cauchy sequence, we'll call that yn, such that yn is in un and the ball centered at x of radius r, and that holds for each natural number n. Here we go. But again, that's the main idea for what we're about to do to try to help you get through this proof with me. So u1 is assumed to be a dense subset of x. That means that there exists an element y1 in u1 such that y1 is in the ball centered at x of radius r. Now, I've got the intersection of two open sets here, thus that intersection is open, so that means that there exists some radius, and I could take it to be smaller than 1 if I like. We'll denote this radius by R1, such that the closure of the ball centered at Y1 of this radius R1 is contained in both the ball centered at X and in U1. And again, that's a consequence of this intersection being open still. Now we're going to play the same game with the next set U2. Now U2 is assumed to be dense in our set X here. And that means that there exists an element y2 who lives in u2, such that y2 is in this ball that we just constructed, the ball centered at y1 of radius r1. Now, since we have the intersection of two open sets, the ball centered at y1 of radius r1 and u2, that means that I could find a smaller radius, called it r2, and I could take it smaller than a half if I'd like such that the closure of the ball centered at y2 of radius r2 is in the previous ball I just constructed and our dense set u2. If it's not clear to you where we're going with this closure, why am I doing closure sometimes and why not, you'll see why in a little bit. Now if we continue this way, here's what we get. 
one. We get a sequence of points yn such that given any natural number capital N, once you get past that index, once little n is bigger than capital N, all the points in the sequence are in this ball and the closure of this ball centered at y capital N of radius r capital N. So eventually all the points in the sequence wind up in the closure of that ball. Now the second thing we get is well a sequence of radii, I call them Rn, such that you know Rn is always going to be at most 1 over n. So we've always picked our radius to be smaller than 1 over n. The third thing that we've got is that the closure of the ball centered at yn of radius Rn, well, that's definitely part of you know, the ball that we constructed in the previous step, but also it's in that particular un. Right? So the ends, those indices match here. And uh, number four, and, that, and that's true for all n. And the fourth thing just kind of spells that out a little bit more about what we can say about the closure of each of these balls centered at yn of radius rn. Well, I know that that is always, that's in the ball constructed in the previous step, but then that ball was in the ball <laughs> constructed in the step before that. And so I've got this uh, chain of inclusions here where these balls are nested and that they all are contained in the ball centered at x of radius r. Remember, that was our original ball in the proof here. And what we're going to do is we're going to use these observations 1 through 4 to try to show that yn is a Cauchy sequence. And uh, 3 and 4 will be a little bit more important later on. So we're going to use the definition of Cauchy sequence. Maybe it's been a little bit since you've worked with that. Uh, so let's let epsilon be a positive real number. We're going to choose a natural number k, just so that k is bigger than 1 over epsilon. You know, I know I can do that by the Archimedean property for real numbers. Then for all indices m and n that are bigger than or equal to k, in other words, once you get past that index k, well, I know that the corresponding points in my sequence, ym and yn, those are going to be in the ball centered at yk of radius rk. They're in the closure of that ball. And that's how we've constructed our sequence. And so what that means, you know, really by one there, that ensures me, well, ym and yn are within rk of each other. And what else do I know? That is equal to 1 over k. Or I'm sorry, that's less than 1 over k. That should be a less than there. And then that's less than epsilon. And so that shows that yn is a Cauchy sequence. Now, we know that x is a complete metric space. And here's why this is important. This Cauchy sequence yn it has a limit, and that limit's name can be y, and importantly, that limit, that element y is an element of the set x. So it lives in our metric space. It doesn't live outside of it. Now we know that a closed subset contains its limit points, and so that limit y, it has to be in the closure of the ball centered at yn of radius rn, and it's in each of those balls. And maybe a quicker way to get there, you could have used the fact that, well, if x is complete, then the closure of this ball is a closed subset, and we know that a closed subset of a complete metric space is also complete. So sure, that could have been a faster way to do this last part. Anyway, what we've got is that the limit of the sequence is in all of the closures of the balls that I've constructed so far. All right, now by number three, we're going to look at the facts about these balls, the closures of these balls that we've constructed. So the closure of the ball centered at yn of radius rn, well, that's definitely in the dense open set un. So that holds for each natural number n. And well, that means that y is also in each un for each natural number n. By 4, I know that the closure of the ball centered at yn ends up being in the ball centered at x of radius r. Well, if y is an element of each of the closed balls on the left side, then that means y must be an element of the ball centered at x of radius r. And if you put these two observations together, that tells me that y is in un and the ball centered at x of radius r for each n. And thus, we obtain that y is in all of the uns and the ball centered at x of radius r. And that's exactly what we set out to prove. So that shows that that intersection of the uns is dense. Uh, in our space X. Now what's the connection to nowhere dense sets? So here's an alternate version of the bare category theorem. Let's let XD still be a complete metric space. That hypothesis is crucial. And now let's let EN be a collection of nowhere dense subsets of X. And again, it's still a countable collection here. Right? They're indexed by the natural numbers, N equals one to infinity. Then the union of these nowhere dense sets is guaranteed to have an empty interior. So that's what the bare category theorem says uh, alternatively. Now we're not quite saying that the union of nowhere dense sets is still nowhere dense. In particular, you know, we're not guaranteed that the union of these ENs is closed. 
Let's look at the proof of this alternate statement of the bare category theorem. Each en being nowhere dense, that guarantees that un, which is the complement of the closure of en, that's going to be a dense open set. Thinking back to when we were thinking about the equivalences between uh, dense open and nowhere dense. So the version of the bare category theorem that we proved above, that ensures that the intersection of all these uns is dense in x. Thus, if you took any x that is in the union of all the ens, and if you took any positive real number r, well, one, you know, if x is in the union of all the ens, then it's going to be in the union of the closures of all the ens, right? The closure of en is bigger than en. Uh, and two, more importantly here, there exists a y that is in the union of all the uns that is also in this ball centered at x of radius r. Now, if you think about that, that says that that ball centered at x of radius r cannot possibly be contained in the union of all the ens. And that's because we've just found an element y that is in the ball centered at x of radius r, but it's not in the union of all the ens. But in case we want some more details to try to, to flesh that out, observe that, well, by 2, that said y is in the intersection of all the uns. And again, that's the bare category theorem right there because the intersection is dense. But now let's think about how can we rewrite the uns? Well, by definition, that's the complement of the closure of the ens. And now what we're going to do is use De Morgan's law in order to say that the intersection of the complements is the same thing as the complement of the union of a bunch of sets. And so that's what we've done here. So y is in the complement of the union of the closures of the ENs. That's the same thing as saying that y is not in the union of the closures of the ENs. And if it's not in there, then it's not in the union of the ENs either. And so we've shown that the union of the ENs contains no open balls. Thus, its interior is empty. Now, the last thing we're going to do in this video is a little application. And a theorem here we're going to prove is that the real numbers are uncountable. And remember, Cantor proved this in, uh, the, in the 19th century, in the 1800s, with this famous um, uh, diagonalization argument. And what we're going to do is we're going to prove this just a little bit more generally, just from topology. So here's the proof. We know that the real numbers uh, with the, you know, the usual metric where you measure distance by uh, the absolute value of the difference of two real numbers, we know that that's a complete metric space. So for any real number x, if you think about the set that just has that one real number x in it for, uh, for shortness or for, for brevity, I'm going to call that a singleton. It's a common name for a set with one element. So I know that that singleton is a nowhere dense set. And certainly, any set is the union of all of its singletons. So the real numbers are the union of all these individual sets containing a real number. Now, by way of contradiction, if the real numbers were countable, then it would be possible to enumerate its elements as x1, x2, etc. And we're going to denote each singleton xn by en. And so by the above, you know, any set is the union of its singletons. Well, now the real numbers are the union of the ENs indexed from n equals 1 to infinity. And that's a union of a countable union of nowhere dense sets. So by the bare category theorem, we know that the real numbers must have an empty interior. But that introduces loads of contradictions. So one is that this says that intervals, uh, like a ball centered at x of radius r, which again on the real line just translates to the interval from x minus r to x plus r, that says that that's not open in the, with the usual metric, which of course is a contradiction. And so what did we contradict? We contradicted that the real numbers are countable. Thus, the real numbers uh, must be uncountable. So it's a nice application of the bare category theorem to prove that the real numbers must be uncountable.